Hi there again guys, uh, this is Renner here, um, I'm in the last week before my qualifying marathon before Comrades, uh, it is the 24th of October, uh, 5.30 in the morning, just got back from my last run before my qualifying marathon, it's Thursday morning, uh, I'm running my qualifying marathon on the weekend, that's on Sunday. And I just thought I'd talk a little bit about the taper week uh, and my experience. Uh, obviously mainly for kind of less experienced runners this, but you might find that even more experienced runners uh, might not know this yet. A lot of the kind of old stigma knowledge uh, that gets passed around in running doesn't tend to be founded in a lot of scientific truth. Um, and all my experience as I've gone along in all my endurance sports has taught me uh, a very valuable lesson. So it's very tempting once you get a little bit fitter uh, not to taper enough. Um, you feel like when you're training you are benefiting and as you train your body kind of builds up that ability to just tolerate more and more volume and it makes you feel good. I mean, let's be honest, we're all um, junkies on it. Uh, we all crave those endorphins. And when it comes time to taper, it becomes very difficult to back off. So we kind of tend to overdo it. You know, there's all the research out that says cut your volume in half and keep your intensity up and uh, stop doing long runs and things like that. And if you really are honest with yourself, I think you'll find that most of you out there don't do that. So I've been uh, preparing for my qualifying marathon. I had a, a quite a big canoe race about four weeks ago and until four weeks ago was doubling up with a bit of paddling training and a bit of running training trying to get them both done at the same time which is something that I often have to do. Uh, and the reason that I feel that I really have to get the qualifying marathon under the belt now in the kind of October qualifying window is precisely because in January, February, that's the peak of the canoeing season for me, uh, which is a sport that I'm actually a little, I'm more competitive at uh, paddling than I am at running. So <clears throat> my training at that time of year will be dedicated towards preparing for races like the Drag Challenge and the Doozy. And as a result of that, my running uh, takes a little bit of a backseat. Uh, and then only after the doozy, which this year they have moved to the end of February, will I then be able to pick up my running and uh, prepare for comrades. So <clears throat> if I want to qualify for two oceans, I really have to get my qualifier out of the way at this time of year. And if you are only worried about uh, comrades, then to qualify after kind of the middle of February starts to get a little bit tight with time uh, and you start to battle with uh, fatigue and things like that and it, it really does get in the way of your comrades preparation so I've been able to put in eight weeks of running uh, now and I'm just kind of trying to do enough to tick a box and, and get a qualifier done not really worried about uh, my batching too much I, I know that I will be more or less where I belong might be might be one batch behind where I could be if I had been able to dedicate a little bit more effort to it but you know that's the way it is so I'm just gonna take it and just do the best I can on the training that I've done and <clears throat> yeah with that eight week training build up I've been able to do a more or less uh, call it a 12 day taper um, the, my peak weeks were around about 80 kilometers of mileage um, I only managed to get two of those in. A lot of my other weeks were hovering between 50 and 60 because I was dedicating a lot of time to paddling at the same time as that. Uh, the 80 kilometer weeks came after I had done the Fish Can Canoe River Marathon. So uh, the 50 and 60 was done in conjunction with you know, up to probably about 70 kilometers of paddling mileage which takes about the same effort out of your body. Um, so having to divide my time then. Uh, so it does contribute to fitness, but uh, not really to your legs that much. So <clears throat> uh, then, yeah, I started. I, I decided I could take a 12-day taper. Uh, you know, trying to build as much fitness as I could until 
the latest I could. Um, and then after that, so I did two 80 kilometer weeks uh, consecutive. Uh, and then my with three weeks or two weeks to go, <coughs> cut my volume down to 40 kilometers. Uh, and then this race week is what I particularly want to speak about. You know, a lot of people don't realize that phys physiologically, you cease to benefit from training about eight days before uh, a major race date. So any running that I have done since uh, last week Sunday actually physiologically is not going to benefit me uh, this coming Sunday. The only benefit that training in that last week has really is it keeps you loose, it keeps muscles activated and things like that. And the most important part is up here. You know, like I was speaking about uh, the craving the endorphins and wanting to get out training and feeling like you need to get out training and feeling like you need to get fitter and all that. That's all in here. It doesn't actually physiologically benefit you. And the most important thing on race day is really to be on fresh legs. Uh, <clears throat> if you can have, obviously you need a decent preparation. So you need some fitness, you know, uh, you need some endurance in your legs. You need that ability to withstand the pounding. Uh, I call it impact resistance, you know, for me as a, I'm six foot five and as a very lean guy, I still weigh 90 kilograms. That's, you know, I'll be around about 5% body fat and, and weighing nine, 90 kilograms. So that's a lot of weight to carry, even though I am carrying very little excess weight, it still is weight to carry. And the impact really is significant for a guy like me <clears throat> and, and heavier athletes really do find that with uh, long distance running. Um, but for anybody, the impact does accumulate, so you, you need to build that up. And once you've got that, you really are best served by allowing recovery, uh, backing it right off. And in my experience, and I have learned over time as I've repeated this and through experience, uh, that doing two 20-minute runs in the week of the race really is enough. So uh, just now I'll turn the camera around and have a little shot of my watch. But this week uh, I always start my taper by taking two consecutive rest days. I do lots of mobility work and uh, muscle activation work over that period just to keep everything going. I'll introduce a little bit more swimming. Luckily at this time of year the pools are warm enough that you can actually jump in and, and have a bit of a swim. But even, even leading up to comrades, uh, which is in the middle of our winter, I will jump in a pool and uh, and do a couple of links to, to just uh, help flush the system and uh, aid with recovery. So I've done a bit of that. Um, and then on top of that, uh, the, the mobility work and the muscle activation actually kind of helps hold everything together because uh, that's always a bit of a battle when you're in high volume training is that you kind of fall apart as uh, everything gets a bit tired and fatigued. So <clears throat> it helps just pull everything back and, and uh, get everything working again nicely. So you can use that to your advantage really. Um, and then <clears throat> this week I've done one, I think it was about a 5k run and then this morning I've just run over 4k's. Today is Thursday, that'll be my last run. <clears throat> on uh, on Saturday morning at the time that I will start the race I will be up be dressed to run I'll do my little mobility and flexibility and activation routine uh, before I head out I'll then run a kilometer up the road to another patch of grass uh, outside of a school that's close by do some more mobility work uh, run up and down a flat piece of road uh, at a little bit faster than race pace a few times um, with a few couple of uh, mobility drills in between and then just jog back home uh, so that run really doesn't even amount to I think it's probably about a two and a half K run <clears throat> but the whole process does take me sort of 40 minutes because there's lots of lots of other work in between which will help me the following day um, but yeah, I just wanted to have a chat about the benefits of uh, recovery, uh, not racing on uh, fatigued legs, because if you, you know, in endurance sport, fatigue, that fatigue battle is, a, is one that we're all fighting and you always are pushing the barriers when you're in high volume training, trying to build up that resistance to fatigue. But when you get to qualifying day, uh, it, it really is important to back it off, give yourself a chance and... Uh, 
benefit from your training and in order to benefit from your training you really do have to allow some time to recovery so there we go here's a look at my watch i haven't uploaded any of this yet so we have to look at it straight on my watch you can see this morning i ran 4.3 kilometers don't worry about the time well the time is actually the more important it's not really important how far i ran however so you can see i ran for 22 minutes I am trying to run kind of uh, at tempo once I'm warm. So the first kilometer is a little bit slow. Uh, well, quite a lot slow, actually. <clears throat> I did kind of a probably about a 10 or 12 minute warm up routine before I headed out on the road. And I did the same. You can see my last run was on Tuesday. As I've mentioned, today is Thursday morning. Then let's just flip the screens there. Uh, there's my run on Tuesday. You can see it was less than five kilometers, actually. 25 minutes and then there's uh, my Monday morning swim that I did you can see it's very short it's just to get in the pool and loosen up it's not for fitness so I swam for 11 and a half minutes so that's from last weekend being just under 50 minutes and an hour 10 with the longest one being 13 and the total for that week was 40 kilometers which uh, cut my mileage from the the peak week previous to that in half um, and allowing time for recovery then the other thing that my watch gives me uh, obviously I've got a heart rate monitor on my chest uh, and it has a optical heart rate monitor which by the way optical heart rate monitors are not accurate when you are moving uh, very much so they're fine for walking around and monitoring your resting heart rate and stuff but for exercise purposes you really need a uh, chest strap um, which I do have um, but you can see the metrics that my watch measures uh, which takes into account heart rate and recovery and effort levels and all that kind of stuff it says that my load is decreasing that my fitness is increasing and therefore increase uh, indicates a training status of peaking which is what you want then I, I just uh, had my shoes in shot there which reminds me uh, so these shoes have literally had one run this morning in them uh, I've been waiting seven and a half weeks for these shoes to arrive. Ordered them seven and a half weeks ago. I have uh, a size US 14 or UK 13 feet. So can't just walk into a running shoe shop and uh, walk out with a new pair. Ordered them seven and a half weeks ago from Justin Hand, the Durban runner. And uh, they arrived yesterday. So I've got uh, my old pair of inner soles in them. And they had their first run this morning. Uh, I'm gonna to have to wear them at work just to bed them in a little bit they felt good this morning I, I know they they'll get me through I've, thanks to my paddling my feet are pretty tough I don't really get blisters and things like that so not worried about blisters uh, and they do feel good they are pretty much identical to my old shoes so <laughs> gonna be running a marathon in a brand new pair of shoes on Sunday um, but hopefully that's not gonna be a problem and uh, that is something that you should uh, be aiming never to do but uh, as I said I, I ordered uh, them almost eight weeks ago when I still had a, a bit of mileage left on my old shoes uh, but obviously in the uh, in the lead up to my marathon I have been doing a reasonable amount of mileage and you know if you've got two or three hundred kilometers left in a pair of shoes you tend to eat that up pretty quickly and uh, had to keep running and in, in the old shoes didn't have a, a new pair I did try and do a bit of trail and uh, use a few pairs of shoes where I could but uh, the old ones are very much worn out now and uh, we start the build up to comrades with the qualifying marathon and a brand new pair of shoes all at the same time so after this I'll be uh, taking a two week break and I will indeed be entering comrades on Monday comrades entries open on Monday uh, and I can hopefully be punching in a qualifying marathon with my entry on Monday and I do intend to build up and try and get to the start line so I'll tag you all along with the journey and uh, if I get any ideas I'll try and keep you in the loop and help you out and just to reiterate uh, I was once one of those kind of recreational Paddler, runner, uh, mountain biker at one stage, I suppose, and I, I used to do a bit of multi sport racing over quite long distances. Who used to battle to taper, you know, I used to really psychologically battle with that, those, all those feelings, you know, endorphins not flowing around and uh, just feeling like you're not getting any fitter, uh, you know, 
ants in your pants kind of thing uh, where you really battle uh, not to be doing exercise you feel like you feel like you're losing fitness uh, during that taper period and over time and steadily kind of gaining confidence in cutting down more and more and more but I think what's important to realize is that you can do other stuff that makes your body feel better you know that so all of that mobility work and muscle activation work it's not really strength work uh, per se so I'm not really lifting any weights I'm not really getting any stronger but what I am doing is the, the like obviously relevant to this the sport that I'm preparing for uh, I'm keeping all of the important muscles working in the right way trying to trying to teach them how to uh, how to work and, and try to get them working better so that my form feels better you know and that applies to any sport that I, that 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 you're doing so you know you're going to be doing different stuff depending on what sport you're doing I uh, also <clears throat> you know my my up, being a being mainly a paddler my upper body is 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 quite important kind of important to the way that I feel so I keep up doing that kind of stuff so for example the swimming you know it really does it it helps me with that that side of things uh, I still do a bit of weights in the gym that, that keep my upper body in condition I always keep up my paddling even if it's just a little bit just to just that my upper body feels normal and and that all those muscles feel toned and that they all work normally although I don't want to feel any fatigue from that kind of thing when I am concentrating on my running um so yeah over time i really have uh, gained confidence uh in in being able to taper and if you are one of those people who really struggles with the taper uh then i encourage you to just give it a try you know you really will battle uh with those feelings but just give it a try and and see how it benefits you um yeah it it as i say through experience uh, and the scientific knowledge that I obviously have, uh, with the background that I have, it, it really has, has been a, a, an important lesson to me and one that a lot of people really can benefit from. And uh, there's a reason that so many knowledgeable people sing the same song sheet. It's because it, it, it's, it's the truth, you know. So just give it a go. Um, one of those things that I always find amusing about uh preparing for long distance races is how how people who don't know what uh, marathoners and ultra marathoners and, and long distance athletes do they always assume that you are training the hardest when it's the closest to the race when in actual fact that's the time when you are doing the least amount of work so you spend the last few weeks before things like comrades and oceans and whatever having to tell people that no you really aren't training that hard at the moment and that all the the hard work was done a long time ago um, so, and, and a lot of people come into the sport with that understanding. So yeah, it's important to get rid of all those myths and, uh, and stick with what is actually the truth. Cheers guys.